Thank you, Tal. Uh, it's a great pleasure and a great honor being here. I would like to thank the organizers for this kind of invitation. And it's unfortunate that I cannot have this physical meeting, but I will do my best uh, to deliver this online talk. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, the use of artificial intelligence for quantification, staging, and outcome prediction of COVID-19 pneumonia uh, based on multimodal data. This is joint work between the University's Hospitals of Paris, APHP, uh, Central Superlec, uh, University of Paris Saclay, Gustave Rissi Hospital, and uh, Terra Panacea. I guess all of you are familiar with uh, COVID-19 uh, pneumonia. It was initially diagnosed in, in China on December 19th. And then as of uh, March 2020, uh, it was declared from the World Health Organization as a pandemic. The disease for 90% of the cases uh, has symptoms that are very similar to a regular flu. And uh, for 10% of the cases, the symptoms can be uh, severe. And in almost uh, half of the cases, it can actually uh, lead to, uh, to death. The role of imaging uh, has been studied uh, quite a bit in the past as it concerns uh, uh, other uh, lung-related diseases and therefore uh, in the context of the pandemic uh, both uh, X-ray and CT imaging were used uh, both for diagnosis as well as for staging and prognosis. As I mentioned before, uh, the impact of this disease is very similar uh, to other interstitial lung diseases and therefore there is a significant amount of work actually on uh, people uh, who have tried to understand uh, the impact of uh, uh, the pneumonia with respect to uh, lung imaging, uh, since uh, most of, in most of the cases, uh, what is happening is that we have an alteration of the tissue properties uh, through the generation of what we call a ground class opacities. And these uh, works uh, they used as basis uh, for actually developing new tools, both for diagnosis as well as the quantification. It should be mentioned that actually there is a tremendous uh, effort uh, behind uh, CT and X-ray imaging with respect to COVID-19 pneumonia. Just an indicator, uh, there was a special issue uh, that uh, was a joint issue between uh, transactions from medical imaging and medical image analysis with a deadline that was early June 2020. And I think there were about 200 papers that were submitted uh, to this issue. Uh, what are the objectives of our studies? Well, uh, the first objective of our study is to be able to perform a precise quantification of the disease. So the idea is to, uh, given a 3D dimensional CT scan, uh, to be able actually to determine uh, what is the lung uh, proportion that has been affected uh, by COVID-19 pneumonia, uh, either in the form of a binary classification, which means disease versus no disease, COVID-19 versus no healthy tissues, or other disease tissues but not COVID-19, or actually even to a more fine-grained classification with respect to different uh, tissue properties that actually COVID-19 uh, can cause. The way we actually uh, we develop that is uh, by using a conventional uh, deep learning uh, approach by using where uh, both uh, 2D and 3D architectures will be will, will considered and I will detail subsequently how this was achieved. The second objective of our study is uh, on the basis of the quantification is to be able to actually uh, address one of the most interesting uh, clinical problems of nowadays, which is actually uh, prognosis. So the idea is uh, to be able to determine among the list of patients uh, that have been admitted to the hospital, uh, the patients that are likely to become severe cases and will need uh, respiratory support, and to, within this subset of patients to be able uh, to have a short uh, outcome prediction. We know that uh, uh, almost 20% uh, of these patients uh, will not survive, uh, especially if they have severe symptoms uh, beyond a couple of days. And subsequently, being able to determine the ones who are likely to recover after intubation with respect to the ones that are not likely to recover uh, after intubation. That's the idea. What is the difference between what we are doing and what has been done? Well, most of the studies, uh, they focus on imaging characteristics. Uh, our, our, our vision, and especially after discussing with uh, uh, physicians that are uh, top opinion leaders in this area, is that imaging plays a role, but it doesn't necessarily uh, cover uh, the entire uh, spectrum of information that is necessary to make this prediction. So our approach will actually combine imaging with uh, clinical uh, data, as well as uh, uh, with uh, biological data. This is the case of blood tests. 
And uh, we target to have an approach that actually uh, is associated with endology with explicability, in the sense that uh, we need to be able to demonstrate the physicians uh, on what basis the prediction is based, because this is the only way that actually uh, physicians uh, can trust the recommendation of the algorithm. And this is the only way that the performance of the algorithm can generalize well on unseen data, given the variety of imaging tools, the variety of biological tests that we're going to have, as well as the variety of uh, different patients that have been affected from the COVID-19. So this is the workflow of the, of the paper, as I mentioned before. Quantification, uh, multi-omics uh, signature uh, discovery for COVID-19 pneumonia, sub subsequently severe versus no severe cases, and the last step consists actually of being able to perform short and long-term progresses. Okay. Well, uh, if we look from imaging point of view, the first problem we have to address is what we call uh, segmentation of the disease or quantification. Uh, this is a, a fairly uh, well-studied problem in the field of medical image analysis, uh, where we try to separate uh, one class from another. In this case, uh, the, we address the problem through the concept of a binary classification, where we put all uh, the characteristics of the COVID-19 pneumonia uh, together into a single class. And what we like to do is we like to be able to actually uh, separate within the lungs the healthy tissue from the disease tissue, knowing that we should be able, if, if possible, uh, to separate also the COVID-19 uh, disease tissue with other pneumonia uh, impact, which is not a trivia. The second objective is uh, of uh, medical imaging is actually to go beyond uh, simple characterization of the extent of the disease. And we need to have what we call quantifiable biomarkers. And what we know uh, from uh, our colleagues, uh, physicians, is that uh, uh, Image characteristics such as texture uh, actually provide a very good description of the disease uh, as well as shape characteristics. It's not the same uh, to have uh, a disease that is affecting the whole lung and it's a highly elongated uh, volume uh, than having uh, just uh, a simple nice sphere in the, in the center of the lung. So the geometry of the disease is also an impact, is something that we know that has a strong impact on, on the outcome. So the, the, the idea is we move from imaging uh, to our quantitative biomarkers as much as we can. And then what we like to do is we like to recover the subset of these biomarkers that are the most likely uh, to express uh, the uh, impact or the outcome of the patient with respect to that. Let's try to look one step at a time. As I mentioned before, the first step is automatic quantification. There has been plenty of uh, uh, papers on actually uh, deep learning methods for, for segmentation. You can actually apply any of the methods you can imagine, uh, assuming that you have a binary classification. Uh, uh, in, our, in our case, uh, we used a combination of two things. The first is uh, an AtlasNet uh, that we developed uh, in, in our lab. The idea of AtlasNet is actually to reduce uh, the variability of your training data by actually mapping uh, all the data to a predefined template. And we can do that by the form of registration. So in our case, we took all the uh, cases of uh, COVID-19 pneumonia that were at our disposal for training, and through a graph-based form of registration, we mapped them into four different templates. Uh, each template uh, then has a very limited variability because uh, the data uh, from the, that at the very beginning were coming from any type of patient have been mapped to the same reference space. And the idea is that if you train on this uh, reduced variability space, then what you can achieve is uh, an algorithm that actually trains faster. Uh, the distance between training and testing is very low, simply because the variability has been taken out. And by combining different, uh, actually, reference spaces, that means by building different networks on different spaces, you might be able to capture a different part of the information and eventually, when you combine them together, you are able to get uh, state-of-the-art results. That was the idea, and that's what we did in the context of the study, just to give you uh, an, uh, an, uh, a precise uh, definition of the training and the testing set. Uh, what we have is we have uh, uh, 50 full uh, volumes uh, uh, with annotations. That's approximately 20,000 slices. And then uh, for testing, we had uh, something like uh, 120 cases for which we had annotations on uh, every slide uh, within 15 slice intervals. So that means that we're able to cover the whole length. 
And for these uh, annotations, we had two independent experts looking into uh, the same patient uh, twice and we were able also to measure inter-observed variability. So using this data and by training this network on four different anatomies, uh, what we were able to achieve, it was a dye score of uh, 0 0.67, uh, while the dye score for the enter observed variability was uh, 0 0.669. And of course, the, 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 the hash of distance was uh, fairly similar. Uh, the second thing we did uh, to improve our, our segmentation was actually uh, to look on uh, a 3D-based architecture. Uh, so we used a 3D unit, uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, when you are looking into uh, slice-based classification, uh, most likely uh, you're not going to be able to get the coherence on the z-axis, and then you are still losing continuity information uh, coming from the nature of the of the disease to the to the lung tissue. Uh, so we 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 build uh, uh, we build a straightforward uh, patch-based uh, classifier uh, or segmentor that was using uh, 64 by 64 patches uh, on random positions in the image. And then uh, we explored different laws actually for this uh, classifier. And when we look into the results of the 2D, 3D network, what we observe is that uh, the precision, uh, the mean dice was a little bit lower than what we're getting for the 2D, uh, which I think is kind of normal because uh, the selection of the patches uh, plays an important role, uh, the, the position of the patches also. But uh, when you combine them with uh, actually the 2D approach, then we we'll end up getting uh, the distance between uh, the solution of uh, 2D and 3D networks that was about the same as uh, between uh, observer 1 and observer 2. And this is what is demonstrated here. So as it concerns the mean dies, uh, both the inter-observer mean dies and the software versus observer dies was at 0 0.7. This was also the case for the median value. That means that the software actually was able to achieve the same main value as the one between the inter-observers. Uh, while as it concerns hast of distance, uh, the combination of 2D and 3D architectures was able to produce a lower hast of distance uh, between uh, the, uh, the automatic solution and the two observers uh, compared to the one uh, observed between uh, the two experts. And this, was, uh, this evaluation was done on a fully external uh, uh, cohort. That means that uh, the 130 patients that were used for the evaluation on which we have double annotations, they were not coming from the same hospital as the ones uh, used for training. They did, we didn't use the same hardware uh, configuration. That means that, that means that we almost cover all different hardware configurations using GE, uh, Siemens, as well as Canon Toshiba. The, the, the resolution was necessarily the same and the reconstruction kernel uh, could have been different. So the, the, the bottom line is that we were able to get uh, on a massive evaluation with two independent experts, almost uh, equivalent performance between the software and inter-observer variability. And what you are seeing uh, here on, on the last uh, figure is actually uh, the percentage uh, of the volume that has been segmented by the software distribution of percentage and the one that has been uh, segmented by the observer. So we see that there is a very good correlation between the disease extent as it concerns the software and uh, the, the observers. And what you are seeing on the, on the, on the top part of this figure it's actually the segmentation of the initial input, uh, the segmentation produced by the COVID-19 uh, 3D network, uh, which we call COVID-E3D, and actually the two annotations between the experts, and there you can see significant variability. Okay. So the, the second step was actually to perform a staging and short outcome prediction on the basis of this quantification. And then we could actually try two things. The first, which was the most uh, natural and the most trivial one, is to put as objective to the network not only to quantify the disease, but also to be able to come up with a classification of the patients with respect to the different classes. And as I mentioned before, there were two classes at the very beginning, severe versus non-severe cases. That's not the first thing we tried. And the reason why we didn't do that is because uh, after discussing with physicians, we knew that uh, the disease extent is one of the important factors with respect to the severity of the disease, but it's not the only one. 
So after plenty of discussions, we realized or we understand that, for example, the heart condition is a very important confounding factor because actually people who are suffering with heart problems are most likely uh, to have a faster uh, uh, acceleration of the disease compared to the ones that are not suffering from heart problems. Uh, at the same time, uh, the, 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 the way that uh, the, the healthy tissue uh, behaves, it's also very important. And that's why uh, we cannot only be, uh, be use uh, as prediction something that will rely on the disease tissue. Uh, uh, and there are plenty. There was plenty of information that actually was not part of the of, of the imaging information. And this is also uh, quite uh, uh, well known uh, confounding factors. Uh, we know that, for example, uh, patients that are overage, they are more likely to de deteriorate and uh, have. Uh, a negative short-term outcome. Uh, the sex is also uh, a factor that is important. The number, the count of lymphocytes, uh, the CRP, the D-dimer level, uh, the, the obesity indicator. So all these parameters, we knew that they were part of uh, uh, the, uh, the elements that today physicians are taking into consideration in order to come up with a, a prognosis assessment and the severity assessment. Uh, uh, so just to give you an idea uh, on what we were able to extract from images and what was integrated from uh, other uh, clinical data, uh, the, the heart uh, characteristics were automatically determined by segmenting the, the heart uh, using a deep learning architecture. Uh, the fat ratio, which is uh, something that can be used uh, as uh, an indicator of obesity, was also automatically extracted from images by segmenting the external contour and by looking into the distance between uh, uh, the external contour and the breast. And we show that this kind of measurement has a very good correlation with uh, the, uh, the obesity index. So uh, uh, these features, they were took together, uh, ending up on approximately uh, uh, something like uh, 350 features. Uh, as I mentioned before, there were features from the left and right line as it concerns the disease and the health issue. There were features from the heart, and then there were the clinical features uh, and the biological features. Uh, this is a really high dimensional space where actually building uh, classification models can be very complex and can be very sensitive, especially when we do not have enough data. So the first thing we try to do is to do uh, what we call variable selection. Uh, our data set consisted of uh, approximately 600 cases for training and 200 cases for testing. Uh, we have put the 200 cases for testing aside that were coming from three independent hospitals that were not part of training. And then on, on the 600 cases of, of, of training, what we did is we create uh, several uh, statistically uh, representative partitions between uh, the three classes I mentioned before, which is uh, severe, non-severe, and short-term intubated. Okay, on, on these uh, different subsets, uh, we run... Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, linear uh, selection uh, variables, non-linear uh, methods for variable selection, as well as statistical methods, like, for example, neutral information, ANOVA, etc., etc. So at the end, we end up with actually something like eight different methods that are, are used for variable selection. And then these methods, they were used for every partition between a training and validation test. And then what we did count at the end is uh, the prevalence of each feature. That means that how many times a given feature was actually considered uh, within the classification problems of severe and non-severe uh, in the feature selection process from any of the classifiers. And since we are looking for a common space that actually different classification methods can be robust and provide uh, a positive outcome, uh, the idea was that uh, the features that are the most powerful ones these are the features that normally they should be selected again and again and again from different methods and for different partitions between uh, training and validation. And this is what, what is you are seeing here. Actually, these are the variables that have been automatically determined by the, by, the, by the software. We have, of course, clinical variables where you can see the correlation with the outcome as well as the prevalence. We have uh, variables that are coming from the heart, and these were automatically determined. It was not... Uh, uh, these, uh, these features were not imposed uh, uh, to the algorithm. We had uh, features that were coming uh, from, the, from the healthy lungs, and I think that's very important. 
And of course, we had heel tissue features, uh, both in terms of shape as well as in terms of geometry that were coming from uh, the disease tissue. So this is the holistic signature uh, for which actually uh, what we like to do is to build a prediction algorithm that on based on this holistic signature will be able to dis the, the differentiate between severe and non-severe cases. Just to give you an idea on whether or not uh, these features are useful, uh, what is demonstrated or what is shown here is uh, the distribution of the features with respect to the two classes, which as I mentioned before at the very beginning is severe or non-severe, uh, with respect to the testing set. That means that uh, we knew the levels on the testing set. So what we did is actually we built uh, the distribution of the selective features on the testing set. And then you can see, for example, that there are variables for which uh, it's uh, the separation between the, the two classes appears to be straightforward. And this has happened for a number of different features that have been selected uh, from uh, the feature selection algorithm. That was the idea. The next uh, step was actually to be able to predict what is going to happen uh, in terms of uh, outcome. And for that, uh, again, the most natural thing would have been to try to put that into the same neural network that is doing the quantification, the prediction, uh, either by adding uh, an aggregation layer at the end that will take all the features that we discussed before and will aggregate it with features coming from the network to do the prediction, or use, uh, along with deep neural networks, uh, conventional classification methods. Uh, our, 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 our idea was that uh, uh, if we want to be able to have something that is clinically relevant, is uh, robust enough, and in general as well, then uh, we should be able to find the holistic signature for which different classifications, uh, classification methods, different prediction methods will have the same performance. So we, we use the state of the art uh, standard classification methods, linear and non-linear. And then you can see here uh, the set of classification methods that were used in order to be, in order to build a classifier that will separate the severe and non-severe cases by using the same principle as before. Now the feature space has been reduced to the holistic signature I mentioned before with something like 20 plus variables. And then each classifier uh, was trained independently on this uh, 20 uh, feature uh, variable vector. That was the idea. Uh, in terms of uh, evaluation, uh, what we did is actually, we consider that the classifier is successful if and only if uh, its performance on the validation test, I'm not talking about uh, testing yet, was close to the one that actually uh, was observed on the training, okay? And since we have a highly imbalanced classes, uh, as I mentioned before, almost 80% of the cases are non-severe. Uh, from these uh, 20, 25 remaining uh, percent of the cases, five are likely to have a short negative outcome, 5%. And from the remaining 20%, uh, half of them, they will have a positive outcome and half of them will have a negative outcome after intubation. So we looked on balanced accuracy, uh, weighted precision. And the idea is that if we have the right feature space and then we are able to select the right classifiers, then most likely uh, these classifiers, they should be able to optimize the outcome with respect to all classes at the same time. That was the, the basic uh, principle that we have considered for selection. And of course, uh, since uh, we consider that each uh, classifier is able to capture part of the feature space uh, that is useful for the classification. Uh, we, instead of using a single classification method that can be very sensitive on training and validation, what we said is that we should use a consensus method. That means that uh, we consider all the classifiers that are able to demonstrate strong performance on the validation set of training and at the testing, uh, we actually apply the same classifiers and look on what is the consensus uh, among their predictions, and this is the final outcome. Before uh, starting testing the method, we need to have ground truth, and we need to have the baseline. So what we did is we actually asked uh, uh, three independent uh, physicians uh, with uh, varying level of expertise to perform the task of uh, separating the patients between severe and non-severe cases. And subsequently, for the severe cases, you know, we asked them to be able to predict uh, short-term negative uh, outcome and uh, long-term outcome. That means that patients that are likely to stay a long time uh, at the intensive care. Uh, the first uh, physician had something like 20 plus years of experience. 
she is an international leader in, in the area of, uh, of uh, uh, thoracic diseases. The second expert was uh, a thoracic uh, disease expert with seven years of experience. And the last one was uh, an intern. Uh, someone had just finished his uh, uh, radiology residence and uh, he was uh, initiating his services at uh, the Department of Radiology. Uh, in terms of uh, classification between uh, 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 severe and non-severe cases, the best performance uh, was, of course, from the uh, most uh, uh, experienced uh, physician that almost reached uh, 70% uh, performance in terms of uh, weighted accuracy. And of course, the worst one was the, the youngest one with a little experience. We also built uh, two other classifiers, one that was based on, built on the consensus, means that uh, we look on the different uh, predictions of the radiologist and then we try to see whether or not, uh, uh, that means what was the dominant decision. And uh, the, the last thing we did is we compared with the one produced by the software. Uh, and of course, uh, surprisingly, uh, the algorithm that was based on this 25 uh, dimensional signature was always uh, beating uh, the, uh, the best expert as well as the consensus between experts. Just to give you an idea, uh, the i driven solution uh, was uh, had the balanced uh, accuracy of 0.7 for the severe versus non-severe, while uh, the consensus reader was at 67%. And when we go into intubation, long-term intubation and short death, the AI solution was at 88% of uh, balanced accuracy, while the consensus of uh, the readers was at 81%. So there was a big difference between the performance of the different experts. Let's try now to see uh, how uh, this uh, signature uh, is able to characterize uh, the severity and the disease. So what you are seeing here is actually uh, a spider chart, which corresponds to the retained variables of the multi-omic signature between the severe and the non-severe case. Okay, and this is uh, uh, what we are showing is that actually there are uh, three areas where we have uh, a clear separation between the severe and the non-severe case. Uh, the first one is uh, gender. I uh, mean, we see that, for example, males, uh, usually they have the tendency of become severe cases uh, faster, more frequently than female uh, patients. Uh, high blood pressure is also uh, one of the parameters that uh, characterize the, 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 the severity of the disease. And this is also the case for diabetes. Surprisingly, this is not the case uh, as it concerns fat. And the other area where actually we see a significant difference between the disease and the non-disease case, uh, the severe and the non-severe case, apology, is as it concerns uh, the disease extent and the disease characteristics and the healthy tissue characteristics. And what you are seeing on, on, the, on this table is actually the, the classification methods that were retained and the performance on training and the performance on testing as well as the result of the ensemble classifier. And uh, the area under the curve was at zero at 76%, while the same thing for the, for the expert readers consensus was at 69%. So I mean that this is something that uh, demonstrates that indeed, when we uh, come up with uh, long dimensional signatures, uh, uh, which are explainable to the physicians, usually they generalize well and they can actually provide valuable feedback on understanding the disease. The second uh, classification step we did on the same principle as before is actually try uh, to take the severe patients and then being able to predict whether or not they are likely to survive after intubation uh, or they will have a short uh, term negative outcome. So we had three classes. The first class was uh, disease within four days. The second class was uh, disease after intubation. And the third class was recovery after intubation. And again, we used the same data set. So there were about 500 cases for training and 200 cases for testing. And what you are seeing here again is the holistic signatures uh, with respect to the three classes, just to focusing on the class uh, which corresponds uh, to uh, the people that actually are likely uh, to not survive after four days. These are people usually that are overage. This is one of the factors that clearly up the age of the patient as well as uh, patients that they have uh, severe heart problems. And this is what you're seeing here, the flatness of the heart. Okay. In terms of long-term uh, recovery, again, we have a clear separation. 
which actually is mostly uh, observable here in this area. And what you should focus is on the difference between uh, the dark uh, uh, black line and uh, the green line. So green line are the, uh, the green dots correspond to the patients who have survived. And what we are seeing here, these are the patients that actually, uh, in terms of disease volume, is, appears to be much uh, less uh, significant than the ones that actually, despite spending long term on the intubation, they do not survive. Uh, then this is also the case for the health lungs. I mean, as you can see, a clear difference uh, on the health, the, the, the properties of the healthy lung are very important on uh, predicting uh, long term survival with respect to long term death. And uh, what we're also observing here is that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, again, the, the heart is also plays an important role with respect to, to these aspects. In terms of uh, classification performance, uh, we're able to reach, uh, sorry, uh, we're able to reach 88% uh, accuracy with respect to the short death, and that's uh, very important, while the reader was uh, at uh, 0.81. In terms to uh, short, uh, long-term uh, recovery and long-term uh, death, were at the 71%. And here you are seeing the confusion matrices, uh, which means that from what we can observe is that actually that we are much better on predicting positive outcome than actually negative one, because the, co the confusion matrix in on the positive case is 80-20, while the confusion matrix for the negative ones is 60-40. And we have an area under the curve uh, for the four days at 0 0.86, this is really high. And for the other two cases, actually, it's uh, 0 0.76 and 0 0.86. And here, what you are seeing again is uh, two of the parameters of the holistic signature uh, and how these two parameters uh, actually uh, are observed in uh, the testing and data set. And this is the classifiers that were used for the classification, uh, both for the short term and the long term uh, uh, prediction. Uh, you can see their performance on training, you can see the performance on testing. Uh, we can see that actually for every classifier we are losing a significant amount of uh, precision when we go from training to testing. But uh, the idea of consensus uh, and the idea of uh, putting all them together reduce significantly, at least for this case, the gap. And this is also the case here. Of course, in some cases we observe the weird results where in testing we are doing better than training, but this is mostly random because we don't have that many cases. Uh, for, uh, for, for, for training and testing. Uh, of course, uh, the question is now is which of these features are, are very important. And uh, we did uh, what we call an ablation study. Uh, ablation study consists of uh, taking out of the, from the holistic signature subset of features and then try to see uh, what is the impact of this removal with respect uh, to the classification tasks. So imaging does not uh, appear to be the most important feature. Actually, biological features uh, with respect to the long-term survival appear to be uh, the most informative feature. And then when we're taking this feature out and we're losing significant performance, all these studies, all these ablation studies are available on technical report. Once we, we have done with the, uh, the conventional uh, radiomics pipeline, and because this is a deep learning conference and because everybody thinks that we can solve all the problems with deep learning. Uh, so what we said is how about uh, instead of looking to conventional imaging features, uh, look into deep features, okay? So the idea is that uh, what you can do is you can use a, a max pooling operator uh, to actually uh, to get features from the network and then use these features as a basis for predicting what is going to be the outcome. And this is what we did. Uh, we uh, test uh, two different principles. The first principle is to take uh, the mid-layer representation of our network with respect to the disease segmentation of the whole lung which was 256 variables. On these 256 variables, uh, actually uh, put, uh, aggregate all the clinical features we mentioned before, uh, that we were able to get from biology, as well as from patient uh, information, and then try to apply exactly the same pipeline that we used before. That means that uh, on this high, almost 300 dimensional vector, select the most informative features and then build a consensus method in order to be able to predict the outcome. Okay using exactly the same principle as before. And the second uh, scenario we tested is instead of actually going through conventional machine learning, how about uh, taking the last uh, layer of the, of the network and then on the basis of this last layer of the network, try to produce a label uh, 
which is going to be a linear label with dropout with respect to actually what is uh, the outcome with respect to the patient. Uh, what you are seeing here are the results after a lot of uh, tweaking. Uh, so uh, it appears that after spending a lot of time on actually integrating properly the clinical features, uh, the deep features combined with the clinical features uh, were able to provide the same result as a, radiologic, as a radiomics features with respect to the severity assessment. However, the performance uh, dropped significantly down when we went to the other task compared to the uh, radiomics features. And of course, uh, we have no explicability, we have no idea on how this generalizes, and we have no interpretability. So it appears that when we do end-to-end -end training, we are far more sensitive on, on overfitting than actually uh, generalizing well. The conclusions, uh, and before moving to some generic slides related with uh, the event, uh, well, uh, we are living a uh, first wave of pandemic. Uh, until we find uh, either a cure or a vaccine, we're going to have other ways uh, that will come in. And today, the most important problem is actually uh, triage. That means that since we have no treatment, the only thing we can do uh, once we have someone with us in the hospital is to appropriately determine whether or not uh, this patient has a priority with respect to other patients as it concerns ventilation support. Okay. And this can all happen on the basis of the first wave, which was by looking simply on the age. This is what happened in Italy. This is what's happened in France. So people that were older, uh, they didn't have a chance, they didn't have any access uh, to these uh, ventilation machines. Uh, and this was uh, a decision that was taken at the ministry level. So what we try to do in the study is to come up with a holistic signature that actually does not only take into account uh, the age and the sex of the patient, but also looks on other characteristics, clinical and biological. And our objective was to come up with something that actually can be uh, explained to a physician on what basis we consider this, 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 this patient is likely to survive compared to some other patient. And there is the stage long dimension, which I think is critical. It integrates different information sources, which I think is also uh, very, very critical and it's robust and generalized well. That, that was the idea. We're in the process of testing uh, this pipeline to the whole uh, data set uh, of actually of University Hospital of Paris, and we are supposed to have approximately 25,000 uh, COVID-19 related scans, with something like 6,000 of them being positive, and out of the 6,000, uh, actually uh, more than 1,000 uh, uh, unfortunately passed away. And we see whether or not we, what we have developed generalized well, or whether or not we can find something else that's even more important. So this is a, the next the next step as it concerns the particular the study. Uh, if we're going to look in the future, and I think this is uh, the two slides that I'm going to use to conclude my talk, uh, I think uh, uh, deep learning methods in general are supervised discovery because that's what we're doing here. Or supervised discovery is uh, bringing to medicine. A whole new, uh, a whole new perspective. It's, it's something that is completely changes, uh, changes uh, the, the the shape of medicine and the way we used to make decisions up to now, which was on the basis of average patient. So, this kind of tools uh, have all the potentials actually to revolutionize the way we treat patients, especially when we're looking on unsupervised discovery. However, uh, I think going beyond imaging is something that is very important. Uh, we shouldn't be uh, uh, we shouldn't be uh, very uh, imaging only imaging uh, inspired. I think the integration of biology, the integration of uh, clinical data, the integration of uh, uh, genomic data is something that will completely change the perspectives. And this can only happen if and only if we are able actually to come up with a, a mechanism of integration that can be understood and can be explained to physicians. So I think the idea of integrating uh, information coming from different sources is something that is very important, but also it has to happen in a way that can be uh, to some extent uh, explained, and uh, explained and understood from the physicians. And if we can do that, I think we're gonna end up with what we call eventually precision medicine. That means that we should be able uh, for, for every patient to take the best, uh, the best uh, treatment uh, decision at the very early stage, and this is going to be a real evolution in medicine. How this can happen? Uh, well, there are three uh, important uh, challenges uh, that have to be addressed. Uh, the first one is standardization. As I mentioned before, 
In this study, we have data from eight different hospitals, and every hospital had a different scanner, which is fine. For every hospital, the resolution of the CT scanner was different, which is also fine. For every hospital, the reconstruction curve uh, was uh, different, which is also fine. And then for every, every hospital has its own way of actually uh, doing biological tests. Uh, it was not the same biological test. So if you cannot come up with some kind of standardization, either at the acquisition level or actually as a post-processing mechanism, I think it's going to be very complex to actually exploit the potentials of precision medicine and the use of deep learning methods and beyond in medicine. The second thing which is very important, and I think this is something that does not necessarily uh, become a, an issue when you are writing a paper, is what we call correlations of, and causality. Uh, when you are writing a paper, your objective is to be able to reach 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.95 precision, and then that's it. When you try to develop a tool, actually you need to be able to show that uh, the basis of decision is something that can be uh, can can be associated with causal uh, effects that we know from medicine, and not some random correlations between different variables. And if we cannot uh, uh, do that, it's going to be really complicated to convince physicians uh, to actually use this kind of methods in a clinical setting, which is the ultimate objective. And of course, uh, the big question, especially for deep learning, uh, when we're looking at these high-dimensional models, is the question of generalization. That means we are building models with uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of variables uh, on the basis of fairly small data sets. In our case, we use something like uh, 600 or 500 uh, CT scans uh, as a training data set, which is not small, but it's not huge either when you try to learn these millions of uh, uh, variables model. So the question is how you can guarantee that actually generalization is done, uh, that the method you are, you, are, you are learning, the model you are learning actually does generalize well. And I think that's very important. Uh, and this can only happen by using multi-centering data, by using proper ways of evaluating the performance of the method on unseen data, and actually be sure that uh, the method itself uh, is not something that is specific to your data set, but can go beyond your data set. And I will conclude with a slide from a, a former student of mine, which is Benjamin Glocker, who used to be a great expert on graph theory, and now it's uh, one of the most well-known uh, and uh, the most uh, prolific researchers in deep learning. I think if we want to maximize the impact of AI in medicine, and I'm not talking about producing papers, I'm talking about really impacting uh, the domain. Uh, first of all, we have to be able to solve full-scale problems. I mean, it's addressing a tiny part of the problem of course, it's helping the physician, the, the fact that you are able to diagnose something that actually can be related with something else. But the big, the big, the big impact, the, the, the huge impact is when you're able to look on a full-scale problem. The, the second, uh, uh, the second uh, uh, element that's very important if we're going to keep increasing our impact to, to the medical uh, and the uh, physician society is actually to be able to integrate domain knowledge. I mean, so we cannot become radiologists because of the fact that we are able to get 300 annotated sets. Uh, and uh, even if we can do that, this is going to be something that will work well on another data set, but most likely it will not work that well on other data sets. So uh, if you are able to integrate uh, uh, domain knowledge in your algorithm, this will lead to better causality uh, properties. And actually, will even help physicians to actually better, uh, will be a significant argument of physicians on adopting your method. And the last two things is, of course, data. I mean, uh, whatever you, you algorithm you are using, whether it's conventional machine learning, whether it's conventional deep learning, whether it's advanced deep learning, uh, relies on data. So if your data quality is not good, then whatever you are putting in as input, that's what you're going to get as output. So it's very important on improving uh, constantly the quality of data and continuing accessing more and more data to uh, guarantee the generation of the algorithms. And the last thing, uh, I think now we have the, uh, the impression that everything is trivial and then uh, you just take a graduate student and then he works uh, three months on a problem by getting pipelines, uh, deep learning pipelines from here and there, and then they solve the problem is solved. I think, I mean, it's, uh, being more creative in terms of algorithms is also very important. Uh, we need to be able uh, to choose the right tool for the right problem. And this requires to have a, a good understanding, not only of the deep learning sol solutions that are available in the market, and this is something that's a trend now, but also other methods. Uh, if you have small data problems, 
then most likely deep learning is not going to be the best tool. If you have, if you're looking at classification problems, most likely deep learning will do a great job. If you're looking on regression, there are other methods that will be uh, also doing very well. If you are looking on uh, linear uh, problems, then it's not the same thing as you're looking on non-linear problems. So there is a variety of methods, and I think one message that should be uh, I, I should uh, I should try to pass to all the students that actually are now graduate students is that do not only looking on a single methodology. Of course, deep learning has great perspectives, and then you should master it, and this is very important because uh, it has great potentials for pandemonians. But do not neglect to actually have a complete culture of the methods that are available in the field, even methods that are not seen to be uh, the best performing now. Uh, because science is about that. It's being able to make the most informed decision for the problem uh, at, uh, given uh, the input data and the problem. And I will uh, conclude by thanking my collaborators. So first I will start with uh, Maria, Maria Varakalopoulou, who is assistant professor at Central Superleg. And actually she has been piloting the study. Uh, then I will uh, thank my uh, two PhD students, Enzo Battistella at the Col Central Superleg and Guillaume Sassagnon, who is an MD. Uh, Enzo worked on the prediction mechanism, and then uh, Guillaume worked on the, actually on the deep learning architectures for the quantification, along with Stergios Christodoulidis, who is also a postdoc. And of course, we had uh, the privilege to work with three great physicians. Uh, uh, Professor Marie Pierre Rivel, uh, she's a well known, uh, one of the most well known thoracic uh, radiologists, and then Fabrice Andre and Eric Dutch are very two well known oncologists uh, at Gustave Lucien. And I would like to thank for your attention. And I will be more than happy to answer uh, any questions that you might have. Thank you.